The Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci is the most famous painting in the world. But despite its legendary status, few are aware that it was once stolen from the Louvre and was considered lost for two years. It was a sensational thing when it happened. Many people have forgotten that and not many people know about it. In 1911, an unknown intruder made his way into the museum and left with one of Europe's greatest treasures. The museum opened, the crowd started coming in, and people started noticing the empty space on the wall. A frantic effort was made to recover this priceless work of art, but the police had few leads to go on. Newspapers around the world ran theories of who was behind the theft, from wealthy industrialists to enemy nations. At the time, it was all over the place. It was the biggest news story of its day. It wouldn't have been stolen if it didn't have some remarkable status, but clearly that got worldwide coverage, front page of newspapers. It really catches people's imagination of having something completely priceless in a very normal kind of domestic situation. Little did they know that it was hidden in a small apartment in the city the whole time. If people throughout the world, but particularly in the Western civilization, were to say what was the most famous painting, they would say the Mona Lisa. So the theft of it is probably the most easily recognizable theft. It's a very Thomas Crown affair thing, isn't it? It's the thread of the chase. The story of how the Mona Lisa was eventually recovered is just one of the many mysteries surrounding the painting. And in fact, even though Leonardo da Vinci has an unsurpassed reputation, many of his works surprisingly went missing after he died and have had to survive similarly precarious journeys. The search continues to this day to find all of the lost works of the quintessential Renaissance man. The Mona Lisa has always been a painting surrounded in mystery, ever since the day Leonardo da Vinci first painted it in Florence in around 1503. It's generated quite the reputation. Certainly it was a very, very important painting when he was alive and it was very influential. It was admired and particularly what caught people's imagination was the technique that he used in order to turn that face into something a little more mysterious than the average painting. What Leonardo is incredibly good at and very innovative in, in portraits is suggesting the portrait is looking at something. What he's immensely interested in is how the eyes communicate. He called them windows of the soul. When Leonardo was painting it, artists, his contemporaries, all flocked to see it because it was so new and so unique and so different than anything. And it proved to be a real inspiration to them, especially someone like Raphael, who modeled, I know, one of his paintings after this, with a similar look and also had the same positioning as the Mona Lisa. Leonardo became so attached to the painting himself that he was unable to part with it during his lifetime. There's a lot of discussion why Leonardo never parted with the Mona Lisa during his lifetime. I don't think anyone has any clear-cut uh, answers to that. Some people think that he simply just didn't finish it and that he took it with him because he was a very slow, uh, methodical worker. Plus, he got distracted by a lot of other things. He was, as usual, distracted by other commissions. It took about probably four years or maybe longer. And through distraction, different travels, he took it with him and never parted from it. For over a century, the Mona Lisa had been one of the greatest treasures held in the Louvre in Paris. But in 1911, it would vanish without trace. In the early 1900s, museums like the Louvre weren't so worried about things like theft as they were about fire. That's one of the reasons why the paintings were never bolted to the walls. They were always hung loosely so that they could be removed in case of an emergency. There was also a lot of vandalism that was taking place. People unhappy with their lives, unhappy with their economic situation, 
would protest by going into the state-run Louvre and desecrate some of the paintings. People would actually stab paintings with scissors and with knives uh, to protest. So the Louvre uh, decided that they needed to take some action. So they wanted to put all the major masterpieces behind glass. And a lot of people were up in arms, but the Louvre saw no other way to protect uh, these great works of art. And Vincenzo Perugia was one of the five men sent to the Louvre to, uh, to work on the paintings, who helped cut and clean the glass. But Vincenzo Perugia had hatched a plan to steal the Mona Lisa. And on the 21st of August, 1911, he put his plan into action. Vincenzo Perugia was not what you'd call a common criminal or one of these suave, sophisticated art thieves that you see in the films. He was an immigrant workman. He was born in a town called Dumenza, Italy, and he would emigrate every year to France and specifically to Paris to work. Perugia was a painter decorator. He was the oldest son. He had three brothers and a sister and his parents, and uh, you know, work was hard to come by in Italy, and he was the oldest who went out and, and tried to provide for his family. This was not the first time that the Mona Lisa had been taken out of the Louvre. None other than Napoleon Bonaparte had once had the painting moved from the Louvre into one of his bedrooms during his reign as emperor. And it was this connection with Napoleon that spurred Vincenzo Perugia to action. Vincenzo Perugia seemed to have thought Napoleon looted it, and he looted lots of things from Italy, and indeed the Leonardo manuscripts in the Institut de France, still in France, um, a, a Napoleonic loot. One day Perugia was waiting to, uh, to start the job and he picked up a book that was lying around in the workroom and he saw this great caravan of statues and paintings that were being brought to France by Napoleon's army. He came to think that all the Italian artwork in the Louvre had been stolen by Napoleon. He was thinking not that Francis I had bought this years ago and actually had a reasonable claim to it, but that it was stolen property, and um, he, he seems to have believed that. Perugia really thought that um, it was Napoleon who had taken the painting, as he had stolen many other paintings. So it was a patriotic act. He was returning the painting to its uh, original country. He got the idea that he was going to take a painting back to Italy, and if he did, well, he'd be a hero, and maybe the government would give him some money. And it was uh, his belief that uh, he was going to do the Italian country a favor. Vincenzo Perugia had stolen the Mona Lisa on a Monday morning, but it was not until Tuesday that the museum realized it was missing. When word got out, it would cause a sensation around the world, but especially on the streets of Paris. With one of her greatest treasures now vanished, it was the talk of the town, and rumors spread like wildfire. On Tuesday, when the painting disappeared, and the police came, searched the Louvre, found the empty frame, they knew that something was wrong. The newspapers break the story of the Mona Lisa being stolen. And this news rocks Paris. In fact, it, it goes all around the world. This was when newspapers were probably at their peak. Literally millions of copies of every newspaper were printed uh, every day, and this was front page news story. Everyone loves the story of you know, a high story and art theft. It's incredibly exciting. I think everyone has that feeling when you walk in museum, you know, I remember being a child and kind of wanting to wonder what would happen if you pulled a painting off the wall. You know, it's, everyone is fascinated by it. And I think even in 1911, you know, they would close all the ports, there were police everywhere.
So in the grand discussion of who the suspects were, a lot of people pointed their fingers at wealthy Americans. Because at the time, Americans were very much on the hunt for European artwork. And J.P. Morgan was probably at the top of the list. He was certainly, if not the wealthiest man in the world, one of them. And he was spending a lot of that wealth on bringing to America uh, the great treasures of Europe. There were certain camps that had their own theories about exactly what was wrong. The prefect of Paris police, a man named Louis Lapine, very famous at the time. In fact, some newspapers had called him the greatest policeman in the world. His theory was that the painting was taken by an agent of a foreign power who was going to blackmail the Louvre uh, for cash or for other political reasons, or he thought it was just a disgruntled employee. With World War I just around the corner, it was no surprise that Germany was seen as a potential culprit for the crime. There were other conspiracy theories. Some people thought that the Germans, who were the enemies of the French, sent an agent in to steal France's greatest treasure in order to provoke war. Everybody was trying to come up with their own angle of where the painting was. But only one man in the world knew where the Mona Lisa was being held, Vincenzo Perugia. And while he kept the painting in his Paris apartment, all sorts of people were accused of the crime. The finger was even pointed at a young artist just making a name for himself in Paris, Pablo Picasso. He soon found himself in the firing line. Vincenzo Perugia had successfully pulled off the heist of the century, thanks to some weak security at the Louvre and a slice of good fortune. But Perugia had been misinformed about the Mona Lisa's history. His audacious plan may have been successful, but he was incorrect in his belief that Napoleon had once looted the painting. Its rightful home was not in Italy, but in the Louvre in Paris, where he had taken it from. Leonardo himself had spent the last three years of his life in the employment of King Francis I of France. Having started the Mona Lisa in around 1503, Leonardo was never fully satisfied with the painting and 13 years later took it with him to the French royal court. It is said that King Francis joined Leonardo on his deathbed. But what is known for certain is that the king purchased the Mona Lisa for more than a princely sum, and it was placed in the palace of Fontainebleau. During the French Revolution, it found itself the property of the people of France and was placed in the Louvre. But that didn't stop Napoleon from claiming the painting for himself. The Mona Lisa did hang above Napoleon's bed for a while. It was after that returned to the Louvre, to what became then the Louvre of the people of France when the monarchy was restored. However, when the Mona Lisa was returned to its rightful home, it wasn't exactly the center of attention, as this painting by Samuel Morse demonstrates. Vincenzo Perugia was stuck with a masterpiece in his apartment and no plans for what to do with it. While he tried to lay low, the rest of Paris remained captivated by the theft of one of the city's greatest treasures. This was a front page news story and it lasted not for, for hours or days or weeks, but months and actually ultimately two and a half years. This was still in the paper with people looking for the Mona Lisa. It wouldn't have been stolen if it didn't have some remarkable status, but clearly that got worldwide coverage for the photographs of people queuing to see the gap. People queued up to look at the empty wall in the Louvre and look at the pegs that were up on the wall. So it became much more famous at the time. You know, even Kafka went to go and have a look um, at the wall. So it definitely was almost kind of a tourist attraction as the empty space of the Mona Lisa. And I'm sure that did, you know, up the profile. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a Da Vinci. And eventually, the Parisians, in their way, started making jokes. There, were, there was a series of funny postcards put out saying, uh, where is the Mona Lisa today? And on one, she's in London playing the guitar in front of Big Ben. And another, she's shopping in downtown Paris. Her image started appearing on cookie boxes, uh, tobacco tins. The Mona Lisa became a commodity because of the fame. And a lot of people say that it is the fame of the theft that made the Mona Lisa as well known as she is today. 
The police tried desperately to catch the culprit, and one of those accused of the crime was Pablo Picasso, who had recently made a name for himself in the art world. Both he and his close friend Guillaume Apollinaire fell under suspicion, especially since Apollinaire had once claimed that the Louvre should be burnt to the ground. Apollinaire's real name was Guillaume Kostrovitsky. He was po of Polish descent, but he lived in Paris. He made his name in Paris. He was very well known. Pablo Picasso was just starting to make a name for himself uh, in the art world. He was an artist that had really embraced life in Paris, and that had been really formative in, in the beginnings of his fame, which he was obviously already getting there. You know, he had done Demoiselle. It had been an absolute outrage, but he was becoming a pretty famous guy by that point. Polinaire and Picasso were accused of the theft of the Mona Lisa, partly because Picasso had been found in the possession of some statuettes, Iberian statuettes, that uh, had been stolen from the Louvre. I didn't know he still had them. The finger was pointed because he did already own, in inverted commas, pieces of work which were taken from the Louvre, so it was an obvious implication of, of Picasso. Hello. What are you doing? Your friend is a liar. The police wanted to know how Picasso had these uh, stolen statues from the Louvre in his possession. Well, Picasso had bought them, but he didn't know that they were stolen. He is jealous. I never bought the statues. I've never seen the statues. He bought them from this man who sold them for just a few pounds. Now, the man happened to be an assistant of Apollinaire. We'll throw them in the river. Pablo. No one will know they were here. Just, just, just calm down. This is your fault. You introduced us. They'll have me deported for this, don't you see? Picasso used these two Iberian statues as models, as inspiration for one of uh, his famous paintings at the time, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. So Picasso had used this as inspiration. In fact, he still had these statues in a closet in his apartment. So when the news broke, Picasso started to be a little worried about this. This is ridiculous. Just give me a moment. We should just get rid of them now. We'd be seen. Pablo, we, we just have to wait. It'll be dark soon. Come on. You're winning. I don't see why we're playing this stupid game. Picasso and Apollinaire were so spooked that Apollinaire went to the newspaper and confessed. He was arrested. Uh, Picasso was brought in for questioning. He was held, not charged, and released. Uh, Pioneer sat in jail for eight days. Police thought that there was an international gang of art thieves behind the theft of the Mona Lisa. He was ultimately released because there was no proof. Apollinaire had declared that in his uh, quest for modernity, the Louvre should be burned. So I suppose the two things joined in, particularly the theft of the statuettes, but they were released very, very soon. It wasn't his home, it wasn't his culture or country, so to be seen as kind of stealing pieces of work which belonged to the nation probably wasn't ideal. Polinaire was so damaged by the fact that his loyalty to France uh, was called into question that he volunteered to fight in the war, and he became injured through shrapnel and eventually died. So because of the theft of Mona Lisa and the scandalous uh, accusation that Apollinaire had to live through, the theft of the Mona Lisa, you could say, killed Apollinaire. While Picasso and Apollinaire fell under suspicion, the real culprit, Vincenzo Perugia, had become restless and made an attempt to sell the painting on. He contacted Alfredo Geri, an art dealer in Florence, claiming he wanted to return the Mona Lisa to Italy. Alfredo Geri was an art dealer in Florence, Italy. He was a well-known dealer at the time, owning an art auction house. He had placed ads in a lot of newspapers saying he was looking for antiques to buy. 
Uh, one of the ads he, he placed was in an Italian paper that Perugia read in Paris. He wrote him a letter. He said, Signor Jetty, I have the Mona Lisa and it is my fond wish to bring it to Italy, where I hope it will remain in the Uffizi Gallery forever. He chose to sign his letter with the name Leonardo. So Jetty gets this letter. And he looks at it going, all right, this is a joke, this is crazy, I'm gonna throw this, throw this away. But then, he has second thoughts. Came this morning. So what Jetty does is go see Giovanni Poggi. Poggi is the director of the Uffizi Gallery, Florence's biggest museum. If Perugia wants to return the Mona Lisa to the Uffizi, He's got to have the permission of Poggi. Another copy, I would imagine. Right back. Inform him you wish to examine the painting before buying. Let's bring Leonardo back to Florence. The Mona Lisa was finally close to being recovered. Perugia would take the painting on a train from Paris to meet Alfredo Geri and Giovanni Poggi, looking for a handsome reward for the return of the Mona Lisa. Vincenzo Perugia had stolen the Mona Lisa in August 1911, leaving the Paris police baffled. He had kept the painting hidden in his apartment for two years, unsure of his next move. During this time, accusations were thrown around the city and people began to lose hope of a recovery. But in 1913, Perugia finally decided to act when he attempted to sell the painting in Florence. He had arranged to meet with an art dealer called Alfredo Geri. Both he and the director of the Uffizi Gallery, Giovanni Poggi, didn't know what to expect. Come in. Signor no Jerry? Leonardo? Yes. You have the object? She's safe, don't worry. Can we see it? They all walk over to the hotel. They climb the stairs to Perugia's room. They're both looking at each other, Jerry and Poggi, going, what have we gotten into? You know, the, this guy's staying in this flea bag hotel. Uh, he doesn't look like anybody who could pull off this crime. But we're here. They go into the room and he, he opens the trunk. He starts taking all this junk out of the trunk. His mandolin, old shoes, his paintbrushes, old clothes. He removes the false bottom and under there is an object wrapped in red cloth. That. Poggi's thinking, this is the real painting. So he calmly tells Perugia, well, I've got to do more tests on this. You know, I've got to uh, inspect this a little closer at, at the Uffizi. Can we take it back to the museum? And Perugia says yes. So they go back to the Uffizi, and Poggi brings out some big photographs that he has of the Mona Lisa. I simply did what any patriotic Italian would have done. I bought her home. You do expect to be paid, though, I assume. If the government were to reward my duty with some small gift, it would be wrong of me to refuse. I want 500,000 lira. It's a 400-year-old painting at this time, and the varnish on the painting has been cracked uh, over the years. Sure, you can forge the Mona Lisa, but there's no way you're going to replicate each one of those thousands and thousands of cracks. If it's real. It's real. There are marks on this no forger could know. It's real. So Paji's comparing the photograph with the actual Mona Lisa. 
anything that is legitimate. And they tell Perugia to go back to his hotel, that they'll be in touch. Satisfied they had the real thing, Jerry and Poggi contacted the police. And Vincenzo Perugia was arrested for the art theft of the century. The news of the recovery of the Mona Lisa breaks worldwide. The news of its recovery is even bigger than the news of its theft. His apartment in Paris, where he hid the painting for so long, was extensively searched by the police. Amazingly, Perugia only served a few months in jail and became a hero to many in Italy for his actions. I've looked at the testimony in court and so on, and I think he's a pretty dysfunctional guy. You wouldn't say that he was somebody who pursued things in very logical sequences, and I think, yeah, that probably the initial motive, he always claimed that he thought Napoleon had looted it from Italy. I think Perugia came out with this nonsense about Napoleon at some point, not realizing that there was had been a king in France called Francis I. And <laughs> so happened the king had asked Leonardo for a painting <laughs> and bought it from him. I think people love to get behind their own. You know, da Vinci is obviously one of the most iconic artists that there is in Italy. And, you know, to be taken by Italian and returned, or, you know, to be in the hands of an Italian seizing it for to return it to its natural home, I think is probably a kind of quite a romantic idea that people liked, you know, that got behind and, and kind of took interest in the story. Perugia was celebrated somewhat. In Florence, people sent money to Perugia in jail. They sent gifts to him. People offered to, to pay his bail. So in some ways, uh, you know, he was a hero that way. But eventually all that wore off. Uh, he was arrested in December 1913. He was put on trial in June 1914. They were perilously close to the First World War. People had other things in mind other than the trial of the man who stole the Mona Lisa. The simple truth is that idiotic trophy art heists get you nowhere if you're the criminal, and they're a pain in the backside to law enforcement authorities because they just go on and on and on. They cost money. It's worse for the, for the criminals themselves. They, they have no clue what to do. Before the Mona Lisa was returned to the Louvre, it was sent on a tour of Italy. Since then, its only other foreign visits have been to Moscow, Tokyo, and the US, where it was presented by President Kennedy. One of Washington's most distinguished throngs is at the National Gallery of Art to welcome a distinguished visitor. President and Mrs. Kennedy, with French cultural minister André Malraux and his wife, pay homage to the first public appearance of Mona Lisa, the Leonardo da Vinci painting that has captured the fancy of generations for 400 years. When it went to New York, it had a kind of royal reception with uh, J.F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy. Mr. Minister, we in the United States are grateful for this loan from the leading artistic power in the world, France. The Mona Lisa has only been out of France three times, Moscow and Tokyo. In 1963, when the French government loaned her to the United States, where she was displayed in New York and in Washington, D.C., and in 1913, when Vincenzo Perugia took her to Italy. It was allowed out for a short time, but um, it's been in the Louvre. Uh, securely uh, for a long time, and it's only allowed out once a year when it's checked out for its uh, condition. And rest assured, security now is a lot tighter than it was back in 1911. She hasn't been out that much, and one of those times was, was by the man who stole her. You can't justify it, you can't say that it was ever a good thing, but it, the outcome of it were good things. Museums knew now if a painting is removed from the wall, put a little tag on the wall that says that the, the painting is somewhere else. Security was bolstered. It really opened up a whole new world of, of what a painting like the Mona Lisa could do. There are lots of stories about um, stealing art and famous pieces of art. It seems impossible that one uh, should do it because they're so well known. Another painting by Leonardo that was stolen, the um, Madonna of the Unwinder, that was stolen from the Duke of Buccleuch's collection in Scotland. The Madonna of the Yarnwinder was taken in a daring heist in 2003. 
The painting was hanging in Drumlanrig Castle when a gang of four men took it at knife point in broad daylight. The police contacted me and said, let's talk about the picture and what do we do if we recover it? How do we tell it's Leonardo? I was able to tell the police I've got good forensic evidence which are not available to the thief. So if they attempted to, to replicate the painting and give you back <laughs> the replica, then I can tell you and they, they rather like that. As the months turned into years, it was feared to have been lost to the criminal underworld. The Duke asked me my um, advice about what he really ought to do to get the picture back to protect his collection. And I explained my reasons to him, and so he thanked me for my advice. <laughs> the Strathclyde police were trying a covert operation to recover the painting. The important thing is to get the picture back, and they got it back. The painting was recovered in 2007 from thieves who were trying to use it as collateral as part of other illegal operations. I got a call from the police saying, um, there's been developments, can you help us? And uh, after a bit, I went up to Edinburgh and um, the picture was then in the conservation studios of the National Galleries of Scotland being examined. And you could walk into the room and I could say, oh yeah, that's the original, but we could reconstruct evidence of the underdrawing. So um, again, it helped the police to have something which wasn't just an art historian coming in and saying, yeah, that's obviously Leonardo. There was really hard evidence that this was the real thing. But why do people steal famous works of art that they could never sell on? We know that uh, there are reasons for stealing works of art that are to do with um, using them as collaterals for drug purposes or for money laundering or for criminal purposes. So it's less to do with a wealthy individual keeping the painting for themselves, some sort of obsession with the work of art, and it's probably more to do with uh, big criminal acts, except for the case of Perugia, of course. The story of Vincenzo Perugia's theft is only one of the mysterious events surrounding the Mona Lisa and all of Leonardo's works. It's been a battle to try and hunt down the very few paintings he worked on in his life, many of which went missing over the centuries. In fact, in just the last few years, two previously unknown works were unveiled that many claim are by Leonardo's hand. The Mona Lisa was lost for a period of two years before it was gratefully recovered in 1913. But many other of Leonardo's paintings have gone missing for a lot longer than that. In fact, in just the last few years, two previously unknown works were unveiled. Based at Oxford University, Professor Martin Kemp, the leading international authority on the Renaissance genius, led the team that authenticated the first work of art by Leonardo to appear for over a century. La Bella Principessa. I get sent new Leonardo's more regularly than I care to confess, and most of them are pretty absurd. Uh, you get some things which are promising, that, you know, you think, well, that's school of Leonardo or maybe by a pupil. This came through as a quite decent quality digital file, and I thought that's, it's almost too good to be true. You know, it's very pretty, very beautifully executed, but you always say, don't believe it. You go in, or you should go in, with an enormous amount of scepticism. With Leonardo, it's very difficult because he tackled almost every project as a one-off. It seems every painting, every project he did, he thought it through, if not from the ground upwards, he certainly thought about new ways of doing it, new media and so on. There was an added layer of intrigue with this drawing as it was on vellum, a medium that is not part of any other known work by Leonardo. The fact it was on vellum cuts both ways. We know that Leonardo is very experimental in his media and it's very difficult to say he did not use vellum. Um, but equally, the fact, you know, if you were doing something which was pretending to be Leonardo, a deliberate deception, you wouldn't choose that medium, which makes life difficult for you. But I did know that Leonardo discussed working on vellum, so it wasn't a total surprise. Only a handful of paintings are universally accepted to be by Leonardo da Vinci's hand. Scholars argue over the attribution of many of the paintings, and La Bella Principessa is no different. If we look at Leonardo's work, only The Last Supper has a continuous history, which is a surprise. You think the Mona Lisa has and so on, but they all have breaks in their provenance, i.e. their history of who owned them. 
Um, so each one comes out in a somewhat different way. Amazingly, right after La Bella Principessa was found, yet another work has been attributed to Leonardo, the Salvatore Mundi. After its attribution, it sold for over $70 million. We had drawings for the Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo. We had masses of copies, and the picture being completely overpainted. Um, it's painted on walnut panel, which had warped over time. It tented, i.e. the grain pushed up. And somebody simply took a plane or some shaving device, and they shaved off the ridges. So it's very badly damaged. Somebody completely overpainted it. Um, looking back now on the black and white photographs, you can see areas which say this is worth looking at. But overall, I described as looking at a drug-crazed hippie. And it, you know, it's simply an unattractive thing. Once all the overpaint was stripped off, you could see that you've got a kind of archaeological version of a, of a Leonardo, and it absolutely shouts Leonardo. Uh, it's been restored, that's to say the missing areas have been diplomatically filled in. Just like the Salvatore Mundi, other works by Leonardo that have had to find their way back into his canon include The Lady with an Ermine, The Benoit Madonna, and The Ginevra di Benci. But there may be yet another hiding behind a wall in Florence, the Battle of Anghiari. I've always been fascinated with Leonardo, mostly because of uh, not only his great successes, but his great failures. And one of his great failures is the, the Battle of Anghiari, this, this massive mural of uh, one of the battles in, in Italian uh, uh, Florentine history uh, that he had painted. But because he used a new technique, the paint wasn't adhering to the walls. He was notorious for trying out different techniques, and so the fresco painting requires a specific uh, keying into the actual fresh plaster. Leonardo tried to, to, to dry the paint by putting uh, uh, these, these large urns with fire at the base uh, of the, the, the great mural to, to dry the paint, but instead of drying it, it caused all the paint to run. That technique was, uh, was an haphazard technique. I mean, he, he was experimental. That's really what he was doing. He was a, a scientist as well as an artist. We still have the preparatory studies that Leonardo da Vinci made for the Battle of Anghiari, as well as a copy made by Peter Paul Rubens in 1603. But the original remains elusive. Some people think that it's still being preserved and think it's behind another painting in the Palazzo Vecchio, a painting done by Vasari. The Battle of Anghia research has been going on since uh, the late 1970s in one form or another, and at one point a bit of plaster was removed from a wall and disclosed nothing. Maurizio Serracini's search has got entangled in Florentine politics, and uh, Florentine politics are, in the art world, uh, hideously complicated. Well, the Battle of Anghiari was definitely painted on the walls of the Palazzo Vecchio, so we have documentation for that. In fact, we know that Leonardo started it the year he started the Mona Lisa in 1503, but um, unlikely that it will be found. There are clues in Vasari's painting that behind this, there's Leonardo's masterpiece. He says, I think in one of the flags in the painting, it says, seek and ye shall find. So, this uh, Italian art historian, you know, had been drilling holes in, in, uh, in obtrusive places in the Vasari to put cameras in, and he's seen things behind there that they, he thinks are uh, paint from the time of Leonardo. If it is in a space between these two walls, that there's a wall in which Leonardo painted and there's the wall in which Vasari painted, and I'm not convinced there's, there's really much of a gap between them. There are searches to find the painting under the wall have really not led to any results yet. So I think it's unlikely, even though quite a lot of people are interested in searching for it. I hope they find the Battle of Anghiari. It would be uh, just incredible. It would be the largest uh, Leonardo uh, ever found. The struggle continues to see if the Battle of Anghiari has survived. And while that painting may not have been recovered, people continue to claim that new works by Leonardo have been found. There has even been a claim that an earlier version of the Mona Lisa was unearthed. 
There was a huge trumpeted announcement of the discovery of the first version of the Mona Lisa. Not very pretty on canvas, and it was owned by somebody who lived in Isleworth. Uh, so it's known as the Isleworth Mona Lisa, which uh, I don't want to be rude about Isleworth, but it's not the most probable place to, to, find, uh, to find the Mona Lisa. And it was accompanied by this big book with gold-edged, very fat, with masses of so-called evidence. I see quite a lot of Leonardo attributions which come with fat folios of stuff. And it's almost as if you accumulate enough pages and you have enough scientific analysis, enough graphs, enough pigment analysis and so on that somehow proves something. I think you can demonstrate fairly clearly it belongs to one of a small family of copies. I'd be interested in finding out more about it, but um, not under the coercion that it has to be an early version of, uh, of the Mona Lisa. In 2012, another Mona Lisa story broke when a copy of the painting was discovered at the Prado Museum in Spain. It was displayed at the Louvre and is thought to be by one of Leonardo's pupils and therefore the earliest known copy of the original painting. Leonardo da Vinci had many admirers during his lifetime and his masterpieces were extensively copied by his pupils, the Leonardeschi. These copies are still being unearthed, but could any more lost works by the master himself ever turn up? As far as other discoveries go of completely new material, you can't rule that out. It's not very usual that they are found. It's quite slow finding Leonardo's, even though there are lots of people who maintain all the time that they're around. It's wonderful that in recent times we've uncovered these, these new Leonardo's. He didn't do that much work, and to find new things is, is remarkable. The last painting before the Salvatore Mundi be, to be discovered was early 20th century. And that's the Benma Madonna in uh, St. Petersburg and the uh, Hermitage in Russia. I'm working on an internet edition of the Leonardo manuscript owned by Bill Gates. Remarkably, if you look at the thousands of existing pages really hard, you still discover new things. But while more works by Leonardo da Vinci may eventually be found someday, no recovery could be quite as remarkable as the story of Vincenzo Perugia and the theft of the Mona Lisa. The painting continues to cast its spell over the world. This is a famous painting. It's a mystery, it's an icon. It's, it's, it's one of the few things on, on Earth that practically everyone on Earth knows. And, and for that, she's celebrated and, and in demand. I think there probably is something in that it's incredibly enigmatic. You know, there is that smile and there is something quite almost entertaining about stealing that painting because that's part of the interest in it is the mystery. The act of stealing the painting and the fact that the painting was absent made the painting obviously much more famous. The theft remains a very dramatic story, but it's one of many stories around the Mona Lisa, many legends, many true stories and so on. She's still in the news. You know, every couple of weeks, they're digging up the body of the person they think is the Mona Lisa. There's another theory. There was just something that says the copy of the Mona Lisa that's in the Prado was done at the same time, and if you put them together, it's a 3D image. This is 500 years later after she's been painted, and she's still getting press.